clergy today believe in evolution. They don't believe in the Genesis account. In fact, most of your clergy today believe the whole book of Genesis is nothing more than a myth. The next question was, why our attitude to blood? Because the Bible uh, says that you should not take blood or eat blood. The blood must be spilled upon the ground. The life is in the blood. When God made man, he put life in, in the blood of man, and that's part of you. And you're not supposed to take the life of someone else, but that life in you. Well, before his death, Jesus warned all of those who would be his followers in the future that they would be objects of persecution. You see, as a result of remaining faithful, uh, the remaining anointed ones who are on the earth and all of those who associate with them and who support them in their work are in a war, a literal war against Satan the devil and the wicked spirit forces. None of us like to contemplate being in a serious accident, or receiving news that we have a very serious illness that may even be life-threatening. When the blood, also, the blood issue also arises at such times, of course, we're all determined that we're going to keep our integrity. Have you or a loved one faced a medical emergency or prepared for a serious medical procedure? If so, you know how stressful that can be. Psalm 41.3 promises that Jehovah will sustain us on our sickbed. How does he do this? Not through miraculous cures, but by lovingly providing physical, emotional, and spiritual support. One means of support is the Hospital Liaison Committee arrangement. Today, more than 16,000 brothers serve on or coordinate some 2,000 liaison committees around the world. How do they assist? Our role is to help doctors and Jehovah's Witnesses to come to a consensus on how to uh, treat the patient without breaking God's law. Now doctors understand patients can make their own choices regarding blood and I have to respect the choices patients make and they now understand that they can treat patients now without the use of blood. Each of us also plays a vital role by doing two important things. First, by having a current, completed, simplified, durable power of attorney, DPA card. Second, in advance of any medical procedure, ensure your doctors will support your health care decisions. How grateful we are for the Hospital Liaison Committee arrangement and the thousands of brothers working tirelessly on our behalf. This is truly evidence of Jehovah's loving interest and care. Well, that's what Jehovah has promised. He's promised that he's going to provide us with the support and the strength that we need so that we can keep our integrity. The, uh, the vast majority of these brothers are not physicians. They're not connected to the medical community in any way. Their work is very seldom seen by others. They are not in the spotlight. They are wonderful shepherds who are there to help the brothers to have the information and the assistance they need so that they can maintain their integrity. Well, what are some of the ways that this arrangement does provide practical support? Well, I'm not sure if you know this, but at 89 branch offices around the world, including the United States and Canada, we have brothers who are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to answer calls from hospital liaison committee members and also from doctors who request assistance on how to treat Jehovah's Witnesses without the use of blood. This is an amazing arrangement. Jehovah's Witnesses love their children. Isn't that true? And for that reason, when they're sick or they face some uh, terrible medical problem, we want the very best medical care that we can possibly find for them without the use of blood transfusions. Well, in the following discussion, we're going to discuss some of the common problems that are particularly experienced in dealing with the care of newborns 
And then we're also going to review some of the basic principles that are involved in the medical and legal issues that arise in treating minors in general. Now it's well known that preterm infants in the neonatal intensive care unit receive a greater number of red cell transfusions than any other group of hospitalized patients. Isn't that amazing to think of? Now, all infants uh, after birth will experience a decrease in their hemoglobin concentration. Why is that? Well, in the womb, the infant is in a situation where there's relatively low levels of oxygen. As soon as it's born, now it's exposed to an environment where there's oxygen everywhere. And so the tissue oxygenation goes up immediately. And how does the body respond? Well, it stops producing the same level of EPO, and as a result, the blood count starts to drop. Well, that's a normal, that's a normal uh, situation for every newborn infant. Usually they're asymptomatic, there's no problem at all. But what about the premature infant? In the premature infant, this situation is greatly exaggerated. And there's definitely a, a negative response to, by the preterm infant to this normal transition. While the blood count may be very, very low in the premature infant, at the same time, the level of EPO in the bloodstream is also very, very low. So there's very little output. Very, very few red cells are being created in this little preterm infant. But now keep in mind, what is the blood volume of a preterm infant? On average, it's this. This is the full blood volume, four to five ounces for a preterm infant. If the infant is smaller, it would be even less. So now when you think of this, how could we ri uh, minimize the risk of transfusion in such premature infants? Well, uh, here's four simple things that can be done. The first one, delay cutting and clamping the umbilical cord. Why? Well, if more blood comes down from the placenta into the infant, uh, how much better the situation is. If the baby has more blood inside, less risk of transfusion later. Just common sense, a common sense intervention that will just help to, to ease the situation later. Here's the second one. Well, now it's only common sense. If this is the full blood volume, we're going to have to restrict phlebotomy. Wouldn't you agree? Because if, the, if they're continually taking blood samples, if they're taking large samples, what's going to happen? Well, obviously, this volume is going to be depleted in almost no time. So trying to get the doctors to get out of the habit of just doing routine tests, and at the same time, as was mentioned earlier, using microsampling, using transcutaneous monitoring, non-invasive testing, all of these things will help to avoid a transfusion later. We've already covered the use of erythropoietic stimulating agents, EPO, uh, darbopoietin. Uh, these can be of tremendous help to this premature infant in getting the red cell production going. And even just simple hematinics like iron, folic acid, vitamin B12, all of these are going to contribute to getting the blood count up. And finally, just permitting anemia, just tolerating a, a higher degree of anemia can be a significant contributor to avoiding a transfusion. What's the second uh, cause for so many transfusions in these small infants? Well, it's the hemolytic disease of the newborn. What's that? Well, uh, for a variety of different reasons, a mother may begin to form antibodies that enter the bloodstream of the infant. And these antibodies will cause destruction of the red blood cells of the infant. Now, as these red blood cells are being destroyed, bilirubin is being released. As the bilirubin count begins to go higher and higher, the doctors begin to panic. They're afraid with that high bilirubin count that there is going to be permanent brain damage on the part of the child. We call that, or they call that condition, hyperbilirubinemia. And it's a long word, and basically all it means is a high bilirubin count. Well, uh, what is the doctor going to recommend under that circumstance? Most often, the doctor is going to recommend what's called an exchange transfusion. They're going to ask basically to flush out the blood volume of the infant with the blood of another person. Now, how can we try to avoid that situation? What are some alternatives? Here's three. Phototherapy. Now, many years ago, that was somewhat revolutionary. But now, in most neonatal intensive care units, <coughs> Phototherapy has become a greatly accepted 
procedure, and it's widely available. There are, uh, if there is a situation, uh, sometimes in the developing world or in other countries where there just isn't access to these uh, very uh, focused phototherapy units, sometimes doctors can just use fluorescent lights. And if even that's not available, they can just take the baby out and put it in the sun. Many years ago, maybe some of you remember when a baby was called jaundiced. Well, that's the same condition we're talking about here. And the way that people would take care of it years gone by was just put the baby in the sun. That's what all of the midwives and others would always do to treat that. The second way that we might avoid a transfusion is using a product called tin mesoporphyrin. Now, tin mesoporphyrin is not available presently on the market. It can't be purchased or prescribed. But this product has the ability to block the production of uh, bilirubin. And so if the bilirubin count is very high, if tin mesoporphyrin is given almost immediately, the bilirubin count will begin to drop. So how can you get access to this product if you have a case like that? Well, contact HIS because there is a compassionate use program that the company has through the FDA to be able to release the product for uh, compassionate use in witness patients. So HIS can give you more information as, as to how you would go about getting it. The third thing that could be done is high dose neonatal intravenous immune globulin. This may be of help when this, uh, the immune system is working overtime to destroy these red blood cells. However, again, because immunoglobulin is a plasma fraction, you'd have to be careful to make sure the family understood the conscience, uh, the conscience matters that are involved in making that decision. All of you as HLC brothers need to be well familiar with the principles that are found in the Kingdom Ministry insert on sa safeguarding our children. And uh, you'll probably remember some of those principles. We know that uh, many of our parents would like to see a situation where a doctor would come in and give a 100% guarantee that he will not transfuse their, their child during the medical or surgical procedure. But as we also know, most doctors, based on their medical and also their legal understanding, are not going to be willing to give that 100% assurance. But now what if the, the parents or the HLC is able to locate a physician who has many, many years of experience? This doctor has cooperated with witness families for many, many years. In fact, perhaps he's done this same procedure over and over again, and he has never used transfusion, or perhaps very seldom ever used transfusion. And now when he meets with the parents, he tells them, uh, I feel very confident that I'm going to be able to do this procedure in your child, and I don't anticipate any problems. Well, in the, given the circumstances, the parents may decide that this is the best option that they have. And they may decide that they can grant permission for the treatment to proceed without feeling that they have compromised their faith. What about the situation of mature minors or mature adolescents? Well, we know that many doctors are willing to respect the wishes of adult patients, but at times, in certain jurisdictions of the country, different places, a mature adolescent may be given the same rights as an adult to make their own medical decisions and even to refuse blood transfusions. Jehovah loves children, and he has shown this by providing help and guidance for them down to our day. For example, at the 1978 Victorious Faith International Convention, this release entitled My Book of Bible Stories was soon treasured by young ones around the world. Over the years, it's helped millions to come to love Jehovah and become his faithful worshipers. Even earlier, the Watchtower began a series of articles that became the basis for the book Listening to the Great Teacher, and later that was rewritten and re-illustrated to become Learn from the Great Teacher. I like chapter 35 called We Can Wake Up From Death because I used to be afraid and now I know that Jesus will resurrect us no matter what and so I'm not afraid anymore. In some cases there's a fixed age for this, but in other places there isn't. Sometimes it's based solely on the mature thinking ability 
of the young person. Sometimes, even if this has not been enshrined in the law of the state, some courts have recognized that mature adolescents do have this right to make their own decisions, but only when those adolescents are able to articulate their wishes and show that they really are able to make a mature decision. The truth is there are thousands upon thousands of children of Jehovah's Witnesses who are being raised in the truth and whose way is pure and right. It really is thrilling to see young ones who they're able to think. They don't just parrot what their parents tell them. They're not just memorizing things. They've learned to have thinking ability and they can speak about the truth. They defend the truth in a very interesting way. In Britain, Tim and Sam, both 11 years old and unbaptized publishers, were engaging in field service with Tim's mother. At the last house to be visited that morning, Tim spoke to the householder and read a Bible verse to her. She interrupted him to ask what his religion was. When Tim replied that he was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, the woman scolded him and said to his mother that she could not understand why Jehovah's Witnesses let their children die rather than allow them to accept blood transfusions. Well, that would be a difficult thing to have thrown in your face, a young man there at the door with his mother. Tim's mother suggested that the woman ask the boys how they felt about this. She did. Tim explained that he would always choose alternative treatment rather than go against his Bible-trained conscience. This was from this young boy himself. Sam then said, the other young boy, that his own sister had received alternative treatment and had fared better than patients who had received blood. Maybe you remember the June 15th, 1991 issue of The Watchtower, page 17. There, there was a beautiful account of a 12-year-old girl who was being treated for leukemia. The judge interviewed that girl and asked what her opinion was. Well, the girl said that she would scream, she would struggle, she would pull out the lines. And because of the way she expressed herself, the judge said, I refuse to make any order which would put this child through that ordeal. With this patient, the treatment proposed by the hospital addresses the disease only in a physical sense. It fails to address her emotional needs and her religious beliefs. Imagine at 12, her wishes were respected as a mature minor because of the art articulate way she was able to express herself. But on the other hand, if a young person is not able to express himself, doctors are going to treat them just as though they were an infant. In one case that's mentioned in that same article, the June 1591 Watchtower, there was a young man who was just seven weeks away from the age of majority when he would be able to make his own decision. But when the doctor, excuse me, when the judge interviewed him and asked him why was it he did not want a blood transfusion, he couldn't explain it. In fact, the judge asked him the names of the fi first five books of the Bible, and he couldn't give them. Well, what did the judge say? He said, his refusal to consent to blood transfusion is not based upon a mature understanding of his own religious beliefs. And the boy was transfused. Well, what does that show? Uh, what a wonderful uh, responsibility parents have to teach their children, to use the family study as an opportunity to explain things in such a way that the children can make a defense of their faith so as to avoid a situation like this. Well, now let's change gears one last time and talk for a few minutes about some of the legal concepts and concerns of the state in relation to the treat treatment of infants and young children. What is the presumption of the law with regard to parents and their children? Well, it's always assumed that parents are going to make the very best decisions for their children. They have a, a natural and a legal right to make medical decisions on behalf of their children. But, of course, there are certain limitations to this. Many countries have uh, established laws as well as child protection agencies to protect children from abuse and neglect. And certainly we have no objection to those arrangements because we don't want to see any child be abused or neglected. Hey, I'm Charlie. Welcome to Millstone Research. In this video, I'll be explaining why raising a child as one of Jehovah's Witnesses is child abuse.
But now, when doctors want to transfuse one of our children by going to a child welfare agency, what can we do? Or when they want to go to the court, what can we do to protect ourselves? Well, uh, the, if you only take one point home, please take this one. And that is contact HIS. Contact HIS when there begins to be some word that the doctors are going to seek a court order or they're going to go to the Child Protection Agency. That was mentioned in the letter to all HLCs dated April 17, 2002. If there's time, it, it would be very advisable to seek the help of an attorney. In some cases, the court will even appoint an attorney to assist the family. Now, if the family does retain an attorney or one is appointed, again, we want to get in touch with HIS because the legal department at the branch has information that they can share with the attorney that will help them to make the best possible defense of the family when they're in court. Well, Hospital Information Services here in Brooklyn, the hospital information desks at each of the branches, and the hospital liaison committees have been a very powerful tool in the hand of Jehovah to provide this support and strength when the blood issue arises. Did you know that now worldwide, there are some 1,700, that is 1,700 hospital liaison committees with over 13,000 members. Now what's going to happen? It's good to have just a general idea of the process that's going to take place if this does go to court or if it goes to a child welfare agency. So first, the doctor is going to claim that a blood transfusion is needed to preserve the life and health of the child, and that the child is not mature enough to give consent, and that the parents refuse to give uh, consent for this necessary legal uh, medical procedure. Now to overcome, point two, to overcome the refusal of the parents, the doctor is going to seek either approval from a court or from the child welfare agency, depending on the law of the state where you live. Uh, invariably, this results in the parents being charged with medical neglect or with abuse in order to be able to get the court order. Third, the judge is asked to grant an order to either transfer the custody temporarily to another person or just to give the doctor the authority to go ahead and give the transfusion. Well, now, what is our defense? How are we going to defend ourselves under these circumstances? Well, we have to go back to the point that when we refuse to grant a blood transfusion for our children, it is not abuse and it is not neglect. And this is for three important reasons. I'll go through them one by one with you. Here's the first one. The parents are not refusing medical care. In fact, they were no doubt the ones that brought the child to the hospital. The only thing that they're refusing is the blood transfusion. Just that one medical intervention. Number two, blood transfusion is not a completely safe procedure in and of itself. It's fraught with all kinds of different dangers. So it can't be said that refusing a transfusion is neglectful or abusive. And third, the parents want to have the opportunity to find doctors or institutions who are willing to treat the child using medical alternatives to blood transfusions, ways and means to avoid a transfusion. Well, despite all of the efforts that are made, it's a kindness on your part to prepare the family to face the reality that despite even the best of defenses that are made in court, in most cases the doctor, or excuse me, the judge is going to go ahead and grant the court order to transfuse unless one of these th three things is true. Here's the first one. We've found a cooperative doctor who's willing to treat the, the, the child without blood. And he shows the, the judge that he has the ability to treat this in a responsible way. Number two, if we can convince the judge that there is no immediate emergency, it's not a life-threatening situation. Or number three, if we can convince the judge to order the doctor to exhaust all of the different alternatives before considering giving a donor blood transfusion. Well, ideally, as HLC brothers, we want to try to avoid going to court whenever possible. If there's any way around it, 
We want to avoid it. And one thing that you brothers all have is your life experience, you have your warm smile, you have your good people skills. Use all of those things to reason with the doctor and try to get him to avoid that blood transfusion or going to court to seek an order to transfuse. At the same time, keep working with the child welfare people, with the social workers, and help them not to be just a rubber stamp approving every uh, request that a doctor might have for a blood transfusion. Educate them as to what the alternatives are so that perhaps they can uh, even work with us and ask the doctor, well, have you exhausted all the alternatives first before they would ever consider going to a judge? Direction that's provided both by HIS and by the legal department can help you, brother, so much to work for the very best possible outcome in these very, very difficult situations. So by employing all of the suggestions that we've discussed very briefly today, we can work to manage these pediatric and neonatal cases in the framework of the existing laws and make sure that the children that we love so much get the medical care that they need. Some people believe everything they read in the newspaper or see on TV. To you, should you. Consider this. Now you're working from door to door. And you meet a householder who says, you Jehovah's Witnesses are terrible people. You let your children die. You don't accept medical treatment. Well, you ask the householder, do you know any of Jehovah's Witnesses personally? No. Then where did you get the idea that we let our children die and don't accept medical treatment? The householder says, I have it on good authority. I read it in the newspaper. Well, if it's in the newspaper, it must be true, right? Not necessarily. We don't want Judge to die. We're doing everything medically to keep him alive. And that's what anyone would do for any of their loved ones. We're not here to watch him die. We're here to get that boy better. So he can walk out and go back and do the things he loves, including the Kingdom Hall and meetings and field service. Well, one night, this is one that's very hard, but here's what happened. When Josh was in the hospital, uh, he said, Mom, a lot of times when you go to the bathroom or go to get Dad, the doctors come in. And here's what they say, Josh, you need a blood transfusion. Without it, you will die. We want to help you. You know what Josh responded? All alone. And please respect my wishes about blood. He said, I told one doctor who tried to get me to take blood, <laughs> you may think I'm crazy, but I have all my thinking abilities. I just want to live by Jehovah's law on blood. He knows what is best for us. The best thing for me is to respect the sanctity of life. And if I die, I will live again. Good example of faith in the face of incredible stress and persecution. Jesus warned all of those who would be his followers in the future that they would be objects of persecution. The Bible makes clear that all of God's people, every one of you here in this room, and every servant of God around this earth who support Jehovah's anointed ones are in a war. Gog of Magog, this coalition of nations, is going to lead an all-out attack on Jehovah's servants, targets of intense persecution. He said, happy are you when people reproach you and persecute you. And then notice this and lyingly say every sort of wicked thing against you for my sake. Well, what do we expect in the very near future? This all-out attack of Gog of Magog will come against God's people. Intense persecution. We are in a war, and we expect to be hated by all the nations. And we expect that people will say, 
every sort of wicked thing against us. People will become faint out of fear and expectation of the things coming upon the inhabited earth. To their horror, they will realize that they miscalculated when they attacked Jehovah's people. They will be forced to know the Creator in His role as military commander, Jehovah of armies. Jehovah will no doubt unleash heavenly armies and natural forces in such a way that He protects His loyal servants but eliminates His enemies. What a powerful description. Simply put, all of Jehovah's people are facing the same attack. Although our challenges may be different, no matter where we live on this earth, we are under attack. He said, I told one doctor who tried to get me to take blood, you may think I'm crazy, but I have all my thinking abilities. I just want to live by Jehovah's law on blood. He knows what is best for us. The best thing for me is to respect the sanctity of life. And if I die, I will live again. Good example of faith in the face of incredible stress and persecution. Amazing young fella. And when he's resurrected, see, you'll hear more from him because Jehovah loves that. Proverbs 22, 6 is a familiar scripture for all of us. Proverbs 22, 6. And here it says, Train a boy in the way he should go. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Excuse me, from the Watchtower of 2008, April 1st. If a child is trained according to the Bible's counsel, the parent or parents are creating the most favorable circumstances to bring about a marvelous result. That marvelous result is a faithful servant of Jehovah God. God's Word says, Remember then your grand creator in the days of your youth, before the days of distress come, and the days of of distress, they arrived early on Jared at 11. Jared was diagnosed with lymphoma cancer in the middle of 1991. We started f trying to figure out how we could get him the treatment that he needed, of course, but in no way would we accept a blood transfusion and neither would Jared. So when that direction comes out to branch committee members or when it comes out to the congregations, if you want Jehovah's blessing on you as a, an individual or a family, certainly as a elder or a congregation, it'd be best to just ask Jehovah to help you understand it, but obey the decision. When Jared was in the hospital, Child Protection Services did investigate us. They were concerned there was negligence. It was just adding to the pain. The way it turned out, they backed completely away from that. They realized we hadn't been negligent. Uh, so as we faced different situations, we'd pray at the time, um, not to have miraculous answers, but uh, for Jehovah to open our eyes and to be able to find things. And it seemed as though he was really directing us so that we could take care of ourselves spiritually uh, through this situation, as well as uh, take care of Jared's medical needs. Okay, let's talk about something very important, prayer. We know that when we pray for the right things, Jehovah hears us. Jehovah, it's me, Caleb. Please help, Sophia. And please help Sophia be strong at school today. Watch over the children in our congregation, like Caleb. And Sophia. Please watch over our children. Help our children make you proud, Jehovah. Please, Jehovah, give our children the strength they need to face Jehovah, pride. please, I need your help. We 
ask you this prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 When Jehovah listens to your prayers, He really listens. And He knows just what we need, even better than we do. I remember many times falling on my knees and praying and thinking, this is it. I'm tested beyond what I can bear. Well, that was truly spiritual food at the proper time. And while it will touch the hearts of all of our young ones, I think that message is something we all need to hear and take to heart at this time. One time I remember the hallways of this hospital, 1,500 miles away from our home, started filling up with people. To me, that's answering prayers too. It was hard for us to get out of the hospital. So they recorded talks. They would look us in the eye and they'd say, now you need to listen to this. It will keep you strong. You see, brothers, when we are afraid or we are terrified, we can then be controlled by our enemies. Jared was worried about us and he made it clear he was going to be fine. He just didn't know if we were going to be. Proverbs 23, 24, it says, The father of a righteous one will surely be joyful. Whoever fathers a wise son will rejoice in him. And it does. It brings great pleasure to parents when that happens. He died in June of 1992. Uh, he was at home. Uh, and the last thing he said to us was, work hard so we can all be together again. Prove yourself faithful even to death, and I will give you the crown of life. Well, now, what do we discern from these words of Jesus? Well, first of all, those who die faithfully and keep their integrity are guaranteed to have salvation from Jehovah. It's numbing um, because it's almost like you're living a nightmare because you never think that those things will happen to you. But it did. I didn't want people to see me cry. I didn't want pity. And I didn't, because of that, those negative feelings, my imagination ran wild. You see, people who are in fear of death are constantly afraid. And as a result, they can be manipulated and controlled. What helped me I, I know it was uh, Gary putting into my heart and mind that this is a fight. Jehovah blesses obedience. This is a theocracy ruled by God, not a collection of man-made decisions. This is governed from heaven. We have to fight. Our faith is involved, and our faith is worth fighting for. It's a gift from Jehovah. We have to hold on to it. It's a product of His Holy Spirit. So we have to put up a hard fight for our faith. Our adversary, Satan the devil, has filled this world with his satanic propaganda. Be cautious. Take your stand against him. It's been a challenge for all mankind that if you make it hard on them, they don't love you. Satan said that about Jehovah and individuals, so I would be giving in to that. We need to put up a hard fight for the faith, as if our life depended on it, because it does. The strong feelings I had and my sorrow almost made me stop. Those people could be manipulated, they could be controlled, they could even get them to do the most wicked things because they were afraid. It really benefited us to get right back in the spiritual focus and get our mind off ourselves. And I could have gave in to my pain and thought, well, I'm too heartbroken. It made me have more joy because I realized that now they have a hope. Soon Jehovah will act in behalf of all his servants who despite opposition and adverse circumstances prove that they are truly a people 
for His name. At Malachi chapter 3 and verse 17, Jehovah says about His people, They will be mine, says Jehovah of armies, in the day when I produce a special property. The footnote in the New World Translation gives an alternate rendering for special property as treasured possession. People around us were vital, the support system Jehovah has, and His Word, His Spirit. Jehovah answered those prayers. They are mine, He says, and He views you as special property, as a treasured possession. Our goal was really to stay in the full-time ministry, maybe doing something else, but uh, we never ever thought we would be in the circuit work. But to have our, our daughter working with her husband in the circuit work, it's almost hard to believe it's happening. We look forward to, to seeing Jared again, having him back with us. So I'm waiting, and I, I know I'm not going to be disappointed. We have thousands upon thousands of good children who really are showing that they're mature and they love Jehovah God. God's people are completely safe, even as we approach the Great Tribulation and Armageddon. Jehovah, by means of the faithful and discreet slave, is providing what we need exactly at the right time. How vital it is, brothers, that we continue to recognize Jehovah's channel for receiving spiritual food. The November 15th, 2013 issue of the Watchtower mentioned key points for elders in particular to keep in mind as we prepare to face the attack of that coalition of nations that the Bible calls Gog of Magog. Now I'm going to quote the article. This is what it stated. This is quote. At that time, life-saving direction that we received from Jehovah's organization may not appear practical from a human standpoint. All of us must be ready to obey any instructions we may receive, whether these appear sound from a strategic or human standpoint or not. Now is the time for any who may be putting their trust in secular education, material things, or human institutions to adjust their thinking. Very sober words that apply so well at this particular moment.